Good afternoon. My wife Stephanie and I are delighted to welcome you all for this debate on is technology a danger for democracy? And we are all here in the cabinet of Alexis de Tocqueville where dem democracy in America was written uh, and uh, at our home in, in Normandy. So wel welcome to all. For this exceptional event, we have the pleasure and honor of welcoming two outstanding speakers. First, Gary Kasparov, whom everybody knows as a fantastic uh, chess world champion, perhaps the best ever, and who is now very committed uh, to the defense of democracy. And Svenja Hahn, a young and bright and talented German member of, Un of European Parliament, who is a coordinator of the Artificial Intelligence Committee of the Liberal Group Renew Europe. And this debate will be moderated by our great friend, uh, Laure Monville, who is a senior reporter at Le Figaro. This debate is co-organized by the Tocqueville Foundation and Le Figaro in cooperation with our uh, partners, uh, which I would like to acknowledge and thank you very much for their support, the Atlantic Council, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, who is our, our new partner that we are very happy uh, to welcome, and the French American Foundation. This event is part of our Tocqueville Conversations program, which each year gathers here in Tocqueville for two days top speakers coming from all around the world who debate and propose solutions to key challenges uh, to which we will be faced uh, in the future. The next conversation will take place on September 17 and 19 of this year. And you're, of course, all welcome to, uh, to uh, attend it. As Alexis Tocqueville observed, democracy is our common good, but at the same time, it is fragile. Yet it can be and must be the way to address global challenges. And artificial uh, intelligence, I think, is a very good example. Is artificial intelligence going to get out of control uh, of, 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 of we humans? What is the use uh, the, uh, of artificial intelligence that dictators can do? So many things to, 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 to comment and to debate. At the Tocqueville Foundation, we are convinced that to be healthy, our democracy needs an active and robust civil society and involve all stakeholders, citizens, NGOs, corporations, uh, alongside to uh, policymakers. And I'm sure that this debate will be a good illustration of this necessary dialogue. Now it's my pleasure uh, to turn to uh, Jeannette Zeus, who represents the Friedrich Naumann Foundation here. Jeannette, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jean-Guillaume, for these kind words, and also a very warm welcome from my side and in the name of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. My name is Jeanette Zeus and I'm European Affairs Manager at the European Dialogue Program at the Foundation's Brussels office. So we are a German political foundation and we are fighting for freedom, the liberty of the press and democracy in over 60 countries worldwide. So I'm very, very honored that our foundation is partnering up with the Fondation Tocqueville, with the Atlantic Council, with the French American Foundation and Le Figaro as discussing the current state of our democracy, not only from a Franco-German perspective, but also from a transatlantic one, is in my view crucial if we want to come up with a common vision on how the West should position itself with regard to, with regard to um, other, other competing powers that are arising powers and that do not necessarily cherish like we do, democracy, rule of law, and the freedom of expression. And as we are standing here in the historic office of Alexis de Tocqueville, let, re let me remind us that it was Tocqueville who said, also as Jean-Guillaume already said, that it's active citizens actually who um, are the best solution or a key factor to counteract tyranny. While, of course, Tocqueville was referring to the tyranny of the government at that time, um, our democracies today have to face a whole new set of challenges. And I think artificial intelligence and technology are one of them. That's why I'm very much looking forward to our debate and our to, to, to the conversations of today as um, 
yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a discussion about the trade-off actually between the chances and the risks of these technologies for our modern societies. So with no further ado, um, I'm delighted to hand over to Laurent Mandeville, senior reporter of Le Figaro, who will lead us through the debate and present our distinguished guests. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Je Jeanette. Uh, bonjour à tous et bienvenue. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Um, as was said, I'm Laurent Mandeville, a senior reporter at Le Figaro and the co-founder of the uh, um, Tocqueville Conversations. And what a privilege to be here live today uh, on, uh, at Tocqueville from uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, uh, office to um, uh, moderate a very exciting uh, debate between uh, wonderful speakers here. Uh, I just want to acknowledge you know, my, my very dear friends, uh, Stéphanie and Jean-Guillaume de Tocqueville, who are, you've been supporting this uh, project you know, on democracy uh, for uh, three, three years. And uh, we are very happy at Le Figaro that this uh, you know, association is working and that we are out of the COVID time and we are starting to sort of uh, get out of the embrace of, of, of this virus and, and start to meet you know, face to face again. And um, so, um, what I want to, 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 uh, to say that uh, the debate about, you know, can uh, technology kill democracy and we will have a special focus on uh, artificial intelligence today, um, we have a privilege uh, of having uh, with us uh, Gary Kasparov uh, that I've known for quite a while, you know, having covered, you know, uh, the uh, end of communism in Russia. And uh, of course, uh, Gary is not only uh, uh, you know, former uh, uh, world chess champion and probably uh, the best, as Jean-Guillaume said, I mean, with the longest record, I think, as a world champion. But he's also the uh, champion who was defeated by Deep Blue and who, over the years, after this 1997 uh, game with the computer, uh, took a lot of time to sort of think through what had happened and, and why he was defeated by this, uh, what looked at the time as a formidable machine. And uh, he wrote a book which, is, which uh, went out two years ago, three years ago, I think, in uh, 2017, mm. four, four years ago. Yeah. Uh, Time flies. Yes, uh, deep Last thinking. year doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, there is one year which yeah. doesn't count. And uh, he's, uh, where he has explored, actually, uh, you know, this not only this f formidable chess game, but also the relationship between human intelligence and the machine. So that's going to be very helpful for the conversation we're having. And uh, Gary, I can, uh, I have to mention, of course, that you, you've been also involved in politics in Russia for many years. You, I, I, I saw you the first time on a stage when you were trying to organize a democratic party in 1990 in Russia in the spring, and you were confronted with this sort of a revolutionary, uh, I would say, assembly coming from all regions of Russia, and it was totally chaotic and enthusiastic and, and fantastic, I must say, and there was a lot of hope, and you were trying to uh, create some rationality in this debate. I remember that very well, and I was thinking, Probably he's thinking that it's easier to move the uh, chess pieces on the, on the chess board than to handle the beginning of Russian democracy. It appeared it was very tough because actually uh, democracy receded. You, you, you became an opponent to the political uh, regime of uh, Vladimir Putin. You had to leave Russia in 2013. And s ever since you've been actually very much involved, I mean, the engine of energy which animates you, uh, hasn't stopped at all uh, in many ways. I mean, you became a public uh, speaker on, on chess. You have a, a website, an organization on chess, which is continuing to help youth. You, have a, uh, you work on technology. You've been an advisor uh, to Avast for many years. And uh, you also write books uh, st uh, about strategy and about the future. You know, there was this uh, famous book you wrote about the winter is coming. Uh, you know, sort of pointing to the danger of authoritarianism in, uh, in the world. And now you're very much involved in fighting for democracy in the West and uh, renew democracy in the West. Uh, so I think you're extraordinarily well prepared for this debate. And um, I, I'm very glad actually to, to welcome to Svenja Han, who, who ha who's had, uh, you know, the courage of uh, accepting uh, the game. Uh, <laughs> it's not a chess game, but a, a debate with uh, Gary Kasparov and to be the sparring partner. And I think you 
will make a very inter interesting duo because you are, first of all, Svenja, the, the rising generation of politicians in, uh, in Germany. You're 31, you're still very young, and you, you've been elected a member of European Parliament. And uh, I mean, you worked in, in the tech sector in the past, and maybe it helped you uh, to, I mean, sort of triggered your interest to get really much involved in the European Parliament on questions of not only of trade, but also of, of uh, artificial intelligence. And you're the coordinator of the committee working on this particular question for the group uh, Renew, uh, uh, yes, Re Renew Europe, which is a liberal group in the European Parliament. So thank you to both. And, um, I want to just to say that uh, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, actually, with Jean Guillaume and Stephanie, we had the privilege to meet a, um, a billionaire from the tech uh, who was talking to us about the future, and he wanted to share his anxiety about the sort of disconnect between the sort of uh, speed of what was going on in the in, in uh, the Silicon Valley, of the change, the exponential. Uh, progress of uh, technological change of uh, artificial intelligence and the middle age of politics to deal with it and the, the lack of awareness of what was coming in terms of economics, politics, uh, technology, etc. All, all, the, all the consequences. And, uh, and he said something which sort of bewildered us completely, uh, telling us basically that uh, 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 artificial intelligence was a new species, exactly like monkeys had been a species, and you had had the human beings, and then now you had artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence was going to supersede, and uh, you know the the humans and become you know sort of driving uh, force and and somehow take over, and this sort of science fiction uh, uh, scenario that he uh, sort of. Uh, uh, laid out for us uh, uh, and brought us to think that we are in some kind of science, science fiction scenario uh, about the machine which, uh, uh, you know, sort of brought us back to uh, the, the Kubrick movie, uh, 2000, uh, uh, Odyssey, Odyssey uh, 2001. 2001, and uh, when HAL, you know, the computer, uh, comes to kill yep. HAL, HAL the 9, human 000. being. Yes. So, in fact, uh, all, all this is to say that there is a huge interest uh, for us to sort of step back in the middle of this accelerated transformation uh, brought by technology to look at the future. And uh, it was actually Alexis de Tocqueville who uh, said that uh, while the others are busy with tomorrow and with, uh, while the parties are busy with tomorrow, I want to look... I want to look at the future uh, and uh, beyond the horizon, and that's what uh, I would like uh, you to try to do now. Uh, uh, so my first question is going to be, uh, what is uh, this um, you know, time of uh, artificial intelligence and, and, let's say, more globally, of technological change? Where is it taking us? And uh, is it taking us to paradise or to hell or, or neither? Gary, if you want to, to start. Well, thank you very much, Laura, for this introduction. Uh, very happy to be here, Svenja. So happy to start this conversation with young generation. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you for Jean Guillaume and Stephanie for inviting me. Because if we want to talk about the future of democracy, you couldn't find a better place than Chateau de Tocqueville. And, uh, and to be in the study where this uh, famous and very present book was written. But before we move into these details, you mentioned AI and humanity. So, yeah, I just want to start with the title of this debate. Can technology kill democracy? And, uh, and uh, uh, I think it's important for us to analyze, you know, this, um, the, the philosophical concept. Uh, because we're talking about democracy and technology. And, and it, I, I think it's a bit, a bit ironic because when we read Tocqueville, his book, Democracy in America, we recognize that he thought democracy was inevitable, but uh, um, mostly because of, he called it industrialization. Yeah. And we could say technology. So, um, and the history of humanity, the history of our civilization tells us that technology always supported democratization. You go all the way back to the, to the antique uh, um, uh, times of slavery, and uh, unfortunately, slavery you know, uh, continued even, even, even throughout medieval times and even to almost to modern days. But the fact is that 
uh, the changes in, 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 in society were always connected to the, um, to the better technology, the machines that made us stronger, made us faster. Uh, as a result, they created more wealth and they you know, helped to bring more people into the loop. That's, that's very much you know, the essence of, of uh, Alexis' the, 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 the cool message. So it's, it's very ironic that now we're discussing whether technology that brought us here, technology that was, a, we understand, a staple of democracy, technology that always benefited society. Again, Tocqueville talked about active society. That's why he thought America would be so, so um, much ahead of many other countries, you know, like in a locomotive of, of, of democracy. So, and now we are thinking, wow, you know, technology could endanger uh, uh, democracy, even kill democracy, uh, though it's, it's um, if we just look at the, at, at the at, at history timeline, so we, we should not, you know, we should not uh, um, see the great difference now. Yes, there's one, of course, difference. This is, uh, technology now um, is, is challenging um, our sacred domain. This is, this is our brains, our, uh, something that we thought always what made us unique. But at the end of the day, again, it's just the technology we know killed many jobs in, ma in agriculture, in manufacturing. Now, okay, technology is going after the white-collar jobs of people who have Twitter accounts and college degrees. So it changes, it changes the, the public perception. But in my view, it doesn't change, it doesn't change the, the historical trend. So that's why, as you can guess, my answer uh, would be negative. Uh, but of course, you know, it, it creates new challenges. So and we should not, but we should not, you know, uh, panic prematurely and think about the future uh, only just, you know, in, in, as, as something, you know, full of darkness. Uh, speaking about paradise and hell, it's neither. Technology, it's, if you say AI, is not a magic wand, but it's not a terminator. It is not a harbinger of utopia or dystopia. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't give us keys of heaven, but it doesn't open the Pandora box and the gates of hell. It's technology created by humans, and we'll talk more about it, but now I want to move to another word, democracy. Because when we say democracy, and even Alexis de Tocqueville had some problems because he used the word democracy describing very different elements of the free society, and I think, you know, we just, we should not, we, we, speaking about it, we should um, agree, not on the definition, probably it's quite difficult, but we should recognize that the word democracy itself, you know, means very little, unless it's supported by institutions. The classical example, yes, if you look at the three key documents that, you know, that constituted the freedom uh, in, 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 in the West, uh, start in chronological order, the, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, 1689 in, the, in, 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 in uh, England, uh, um, uh, Declaration of Independence, 1776 in America, and the, uh, the 1789, um, uh, uh, the Declaration of very politically incorrect title, Declaration of the Rights of Men and of, and of Citizens here in <laughs> France. So, yeah, it's, I always challenge the audience, especially young audience, asking how many times the word democracy was used in these three documents. And you can guess the answer, zero. Mm -hmm. It was just because it's, it, it, it's democracy itself, it's just, you know, it's, it's a word. It's about rights that can be guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So, and... I think it's very important for us to actually to not, not to be caught by, by, by this overused word democracy that unfortunately is being overused even by dictators. Now, everybody wants to pretend that, oh, we have democratic elections. You know, this is in, somewhere in Turkmenistan now. They have a constitution that basically guarantees that the power comes from the dictator to his son. But it's, it's, of course, it will be all done democratically. So, um, and, um, and I'm, you know, uh, uh, I'm of the opinion that you know, it's uh, while new technology, specifically AI, that we will be covering in this conversation, offers um, new challenges to us, it's eventually it, the balance should be in favor of, sorry to say, democracy and, and, and the progress, and it will benefit us, though, again, it's not, uh, it's not a simple zero-sum game, so it's this, and it's not a win-win situation. It's, you know, it's, it's not a black and white game, not chess. It's something that is it's, uh, more blurry, but I, you know, I remain an optimist. Technology always supported democratic uh, development, made society more open and, and more inclusive. And, uh, and I see no reason why we should think that the, the newest uh, um, uh, um, disruptive technology uh, should uh, um, work uh, in the opposite direction. 
Thank you very much, uh, Gary. And there is, I mean, there is a lot to answer to to your, uh, I mean, to to prolong your debate. And you were mentioning actually the importance of industry for, uh, you know, the. Uh, uh, coming of, of uh, the democratic age and you sort of that it went together indeed uh, you know in Tocqueville's vision of a, of a, of a democracy in America uh, but it, it is true also that uh, although I, I, I can feel you, you know your your optimism about technology that brought progress and uh, we also saw you know technology uh, being a threat sometimes and that we had to handle in in, in different ways like for instance nuclear, the nuclear bomb, nuclear energy, uh, uh, biochemical uh, weapons. I mean, there were moments when, when humans actually uh, gathered to, to uh, sort of organize, you know, how they would deal or, uh, or, you know, not touch such or such technology or, you know, keep it in a framework. And that leads me actually to you, Svenja. Uh, we, we're going to come back to these questions. I, I wanted you to really react maybe a bit like Gary on, on the on the framing of the of the conversation mm -hmm. and and on the, this uh, question of uh, um, you know technological progress and artificial intelligence and 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 what I want to ask you is do you think maybe unlike Gary that there is something part particular I mean something new about this uh, uh, artificial intelligence that mm -hmm. didn't exist with other technological mm -hmm. progress, something that would make you particularly not at ease. And uh, I just wanted to, to quote uh, Elon Musk, uh, mm. who is uh, actually, you know, uh, someone who, who knows a bit about artificial uh, intelligence. I'm not so sure. Oh, that's well. That's not <laughs> that's, that's not a, he's, 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 he's one of my heroes, but, you know, it's, this is, you know it's, it's, I'm not here to talk about Gore or other games, you know, so that's why I don't think that Elon Musk is an authority. He has an opinion, entitled his opinion, yes. but I wouldn't take it, you know, uh, uh, with the same cr credentials as uh, when he speaks about space exploration. Okay, but still, I mean, he has, the, he, he expresses as, as much as other, uh, I would say, people in the Silicon Valley, some fear, and, and he says uh, what is going on in terms of acceleration of uh, of uh, you know exponential progress in artificial intelligence scares the hell out of me, and he is sort of uh, really uh, seems to be um, warning that uh, I mean he says, and I know you disagree, uh, Gary, that uh, artificial intelligence will soon be as smart as humans, and it will overtake us by 2025. That's what he said in a recent talk. I mean. I don't know. I, I'm not an expert. I'm a candid here, but I want to ask you uh, y your thoughts. You know, uh, for the beginning of this conversation. Well, I mean, the the whole uh, dialogue we're having as uh, technology going to kill democracy. I think, uh, and I think Gary had some very interesting remarks about democracy. Um, and uh, as someone coming from a country that had, in the recent past, uh, two authoritarian regimes on on our soil. And uh, being here in France, uh, we know that democracy is something that is never granted. Democracy, per se, is something fragile that we always must work to preserve and to develop. And, of course, there's always, if there is dramatic, dramatic change, that is, of course, impacting democracy. And uh, if, we're, if we're looking at technology, I'm, I'm not convinced that tomorrow um, we're going to have that scenario that the machines are going to rule over us. I don't think that this is going to happen. Machines and technology is created by humans, so they, they will be operated in a framework we as humans set. But what the threat can be, how humans use technology to maybe foster authoritarianism, to undermine democracy, that is a threat we, we can talk about because this is something we see happening in authoritarian countries. And this is why it's so important that democratic countries come together and set a framework in which we are okay to use and enable technology because we've always seen dramatic changes and uh, I'm quite certain when book printing was invented some church people were saying oh you're going to make all the monks unemployed because they're no longer going to write all the books so th there's always been change and, th and there's always been breaks and uh, the digital revolution is now comparable to the industrial revolution 
Um, and that has been navigated as well. But it's up to us human, and especially we as Democrats, should be setting the framework in which we're going to um, be operating in and what we want to do. And uh, if we look at, uh, at this uh, quote from, from Elon Musk, where it says that, that uh, technology is going to overrule us, I don't think that is the possibility. Um, I mean, those machines, yes, of course, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, that it's going to be self-learning, but it also will always depend on the data it is going to be fed with. So that is another topic we need to talk about, so that we're not repeating, for example, biases that are existing in our society and enshrining that. Um, but what will it mean uh, if we have smart technologies for us as humankind, not mankind, but humankind? Um, so will we reach peak evolution because we're getting so comfortable? Um, will we still have philosophical debates or will we get comfortable because we have technology taking care of many things? I think this is rather a debate we should have. I'm, I'm not afraid of machines ruling over us, but maybe human getting lazy. It's a, I think it's a very good point, very interesting, and I'm sure Gary is going to have uh, something to say on that, because in your book, you talk about, you, you raise the question, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, uh, to what extent uh, this sort of what you call the, the, um, the, the influence of, of uh, the machine on chess, for instance, of the chess game, is influencing the way the new generations of players who've been... Uh, uh, actually using uh, uh, the machine as a, as a supportive uh, element and to, I would say, to uh, demultiply their uh, capacity in chess, is it, uh, do they uh, give up in the process something that you had in terms of uh, uh, more cr uh, less creativity, uh, more, you know, a game, I think you, you say something like they're starting to play more like the machines than we, than we did. Um, yeah, first of all, I agree with what Sven has said about human impact on the potential f dangers in the future. I always say that humans still have monopoly for evil. So, and it's very important because you, you, you're asking questions and I think it's just, it's somehow, you know, you jump from, you know, from one to another. It's no. machines, no, it's, it's, I believe, and I, it seems that we're in agreement here that uh, the problem is, is with us humans. Even when we'll talk about the data, it's what, human accumulated data and the Absolutely. bias. So, at the, in the bottom, we always reach problems of the society. And I think it's in this debate we should be very cautious you know, because the line is blurry. I know. Like, like, and we, we, need, we need to concentrate on, 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 on human problems. And again, it says it's, uh, panic, panicking is easy. You get, when we say something new, oh, panicking, which is amazing. You know, you're talking from someone who is a great you know, inventor and, and a pioneer of this new uh, era of private space exploration. The, at, at, at the time where we are watching high-definition videos from Mars, mm -hmm. 80 million kilometers away, or God knows, I just, it's, it's, and, and we're talking about the problems, so we should look at the positive side. Thanks to this the great technology, we're exploring space. We should look in the oceans. We know less than 5% of the life in the ocean, so we should celebrate it. You know, intelligent machines should make us smarter. Mm -hmm. Again, there are challenges, but challenges on, 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 on the human side. And, and um, it's, again, I, I, there's a lot I, I want to say, but it's just I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we, we go in as this point by point because it's so easy, to be, so easy to be, to be, to be o over, overwhelmed. But um, I, um, speaking about this, 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 this the, um, the problems of humans with the machines, yes, I n knew it from chess, uh, but it um, it's exists e everywhere because it's so easy for us to be overwhelmed by the machine because you believe machine is all-seeing monster. So we just it's the, you always look for an answer just for the machine. Now, this is something that we should remember. Machines are not intelligent. Deep Blue, that I faced in 96, by the way, I won the first match. So, and in 97, where I lost, so was as intelligent as your alarm clock. A very expensive one, $10 million piece, but not intelligent at all. It didn't have to be intelligent. This is a mistake made by 
yeah, I, I think I could be as so arrogant. So artificial intelligence yeah. is not the right word for you. Yes, it's 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 it's, it's again it's 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 a flash word. It's, it, again, let's you know let's separate us from this Hollywood brainwashing production because and, and the not all technology is artificial intelligence. E exactly. Of course. So some are just very simple algorithms. I prefer no, augmented I intelligence. I strongly suggest we use the word augmented intelligence because it's it's not it's not freaking us out. It's not threatening. But again. We should remember that the, the ideas that came from the past, you know, from the founding fathers like Alan Turing, Claude Shannon, Norbert Wiener, and many others, is this, you know, they thought about machines, you know, thinking like humans because they didn't see uh, 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 that's you know, the moment where computing power, brute force, mm -hmm. just, just brute force could solve problems. Yeah. Machines dominate every game. Game of chess, game of Go, of go. Uh, game of Shogi, Japanese chess, uh, uh, all video games, Dota, Starcraft, uh, Texas Hold'em Poker. Every game that can be described as a closed system. Closed system. Because machines, they cannot calculate everything. They cannot solve the problem. They cannot solve the game, but they make fewer mistakes. Yeah, maybe we can say they have steady hand. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you know, we lost because machines dominate closed system, but there's not a single piece of evidence that machines capable of taking information from one closed system to another mm -hmm. to, to make this transfer. And, uh, and that's why you know, I, I remain optimistic. And I think it's very important for us to understand exactly what is our role in these very sensitive relations. And that's what I'm, I've been trying to do with uh, working with um, with young rising stars, because all, often you see them saying, oh, it's the, this is a bad move because machine said so. Uh, I said, look, you know, I, I also see it on the screen, but can you explain to me why, why? it's wrong? And very often they stared at you at, without understanding the question. What do you mean, why? Because machine said so. Yeah, so but it, someone it, would have had to tell the machine it, why but, it's but, a bad move. Yeah, but, yeah. but, but we, again, we should, you know, become, you know, more human in these relations. Mm -hmm. uh, for ma so many years, if not decades, there was a b the, the best compliment was he or she works like a machine. Yeah. I think now that should be not a compliment, but the opposite. <laughs> so we just have to, we have to encourage us humans to become more human, to bring human creativity, human emotions, because that's the way to enrich the human-machine collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, uh, it's, uh, I... I, I take your point. I started from the, this uh, science, science fiction uh, uh, scenario because it's on people's mind, and uh, you know I think we have to br we had to bring it in in the debate from the start. I, I knew you were going to shift to the political, of course, uh, 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 sphere. I haven't, and, I haven't and yet. We haven't <laughs> yet. We haven't. Yeah, no, no. But we, that's where we headed. We we are now talking about you know. Uh, to what extent, you know, I the, the, the question with technology is uh, rested with the humans and how they're going to approach it, to accommodate or to, uh, to let the machines actually uh, sort of, uh, to uh, uh, abandon, I would say, to machines more and more, uh, you know, activities Lawrence, and, and I why. I think you have a good point. So I, I think, think it's important to uh, actually to address this because it's on people's mind. And, and uh, so it's, it's, it's not jumping from one thing to another, it's on the contrary starting from this uh, particular topic to, to move to where is the problem. And I think, mm -hmm. I think really uh, y y both of you are, uh, uh, in fact, do agree, uh, but I, I, I nevertheless stress that uh, people who are not totally, you know, uh, I would say incompetent uh, like Elon Musk disagree with you. Uh, uh, you, you agree on, on the fact that it's the, 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 the only problem is how we are going to deal with the machines. Mm. So that's, that's what, I, uh, that's what you, I understand. You asked me if, if there's like something new. And uh, in fact, we have like artificial around since at least the 80s. It's older than me. Um, but still, uh, I think you raised a very important point. I think people have some fears because there are misconceptions. Uh, because when I talk about artificial intelligence, I have people thinking about the Terminator movie. I have them thinking Matrix. about this uh, Matrix, uh, about uh, the um, uh, this uh, movie with Tom Cruise. What is it? Where they the three oh, things uh, live in the tank and predict the uh, crimes. Uh, uh, minority, report. Mi minority report. Minority report. Minority report. So, so this is what a lot of people have in mind. And then you tell them, well, actually artificial intelligence is your music app that 
depending on your taste, is suggesting new songs for you. This is not a threat. Or uh, your, your dating app, depending on who you match, is suggesting new people to you. So it's actually, in fact, all around you. So I think a really important but part uh, is about... This part could be frightening, actually, I think. Oh, <laughs> or it's a great service. Uh, yeah, I uh, mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, that's I where I we... It's we important to understand that it's actually already around you. It's not some distant future. And uh, to, to understand that some sometimes are very simple algorithm and some of course are artificial intelligence and uh, uh, overall it comes to how humans are using it exactly and, uh, what kind of oversight are we having and what kind of it's not about the technology it's about the use of yes. technology the application what kind of application do we want yes to give simple example like uh, my my face recognition on my phone super easy to unlock my phone but i don't want biometric surveillance uh, in public spaces and the government being able to track me same technology basis, but different use cases. Yes. So, uh, and that leads us to the to the uh, you know the key question of of uh, when you s you set up these this technology, what is the freedom of choice which is left to the uh, uh, to the human being? For instance, if you take the case of the uh, automated, I mean, uh, driverless uh, cars, uh, are they going to be connected? You know, I mean, some philosophers are s are asking. The question is. If you if you get to a, a driverless car which is co uh, um, you know constantly connected, I, you you have a problem because you, you 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 must have the choice to disconnect your car and decide to go uh, left in, instead of of right, even if it's not su su you know accepted as effic uh, sufficiently efficient, et cetera, et cetera. So so that's the fr that's part of the framework, I, I would say. Um. You mentioned driverless cars, yeah, and, yes. and of course, that's a big concern. The moment you have one accident with a driverless car, so it's a front page of a newspaper, disaster. The fact is that 40,000 people or so being killed in car accidents in America due to human mistakes, it's statistics. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to closed systems. And it's, of course, not, not a closed system, but still it's, it's, it's something that you know, could, could be considered you know, a semi-closed system because there's so much data there. So uh, machines will not solve all our problems. No robot technology in the world will ever guarantee you 100% success. But they will be making fewer mistakes. And in case of driving, it, it means many lives will be saved. Mm -hmm. My answer to you, I don't want you to have a choice to, to go right or left, because the, the outcome will be, will be negative in terms of loss of human life. So if we could actually centralize everything and leave it in, in, in the hands of the, of the, of the machines and this, the, the, tr the traffic, yeah, it's just some people will feel maybe uncomfortable, but thousands of lives will be saved. So that's, it's again, it's pure statistics. We know machines making fewer mistakes, and we just have to try to bas basically uh, remove or uh, relocate some functions where machines are doing a better job. Yeah, I know, but a better job for what? I mean, I think this is a question for, you know, who you are a well, liberal. Well, I think there is still a question of... of uh, of the freedom of choice, because if you, the, the efficiency is important, saving lives efficiency? is important. Yeah. Efficiency, saving lives is important, but there, there is also, you know, the, uh, the, the freedom to choose ah, okay, should, be, should be, should be, should uh, be preserved. Are you, are you flying? Often, <laughs> yes. Yes. You don't mind that, you know, ninety-five percent of the flying time is autopilot. It's, so you, you, do you want pilot to have a freedom of freedom of movement, or you rely yes. on autopilot? So, and this is take off and landing. Eventually, probably take of a landing also will be machine, but right now it's ninety five percent is autopilot. So what's the, what's the problem? I don't know. Do you f do you um, f do you feel there is a problem here? It's, it's I, an I interesting I question. I think there is a philosophical issue. I mean, Gary has an important point. We mm. cannot forget that humans are not perfect. We cannot pretend in a discussion of not. that that but humans do we are, want are perfect. To live in a perfect world either. That that is an interesting philosophical point. Yes. I mean, uh, as humans, we are making mistakes and. Uh, um, and the technology has the opportunities to reduce mistakes where they're happening. Um, but also, uh, you should be entitled to make bad decisions. But uh, where th And that, for me, is an elementary question about freedom. Exactly. Uh, I mean, for you, personally, if you decide to... to to speed, we have already c uh, cars that recognize the speed limit and, and are not allowing you to drive faster. 
you can, as a human, decide to drive faster. It's breaking the rules, um, it's most likely not safe, but it's your freedom of choice. But the question is, you're not only endangering yourself, you're also endangering Bingo. someone else. Mm -hmm. So this is where, where yeah. is the liv level or the limit of personal liberty, exactly. of personal freedom, reaching out into someone else. And I think this is the basis that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about this. And then maybe not being able to speed anymore in a right. car, because the technology decides based on what human decided, as this is the rule, this is the framework of our cooperation. So it's not the machines um, doing that, but it's, the, it's technology uh, enabling what a human decided in the framework. Yes, but that, of course, is an interesting uh, debate. It maybe is a very taking it away debate. from the car, where we're talking about maybe security I issues. I would say it's a very important debate, and that cannot be taken away. I mean, I, I, I say that under the control of Alexis Tocqueville, cannot be taken away from society. And from citizens, and that's w and that leads me to the next question, which is the question of awareness of, of what's going on in, in in terms of technology, where we are headed, and 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 uh, actually, I wanted to uh, to ask both of you, uh, to uh, are we? Uh, uh, th th it seems to me that the, the biggest challenge, actually, at the moment, is the pace of this technological change and the the potential. Uh, you know, societal changes that it's it's leading to, and the 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 lack of awareness or lack of political framework, because it seems like uh, indeed politics are in the middle age for uh, actually reorganizing and even thinking through what is happening to us. To be perfectly honest, I don't think that this is going at warp speed. Uh, many technologies are around that they're they're older than I am. Um, so I don't think this is like uh, going so fast uh, like a cabriolet, like a convertible driving and we're all losing our wigs. No, absolutely not. We have perfectly amount of time to fix our hair. Um, so it's, um, but it's of course a question that we're in the, in the past seeing quick developments of usage of technology. And uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, economic opportunities. And in fact, we haven't yet talked about that. Mm -hmm. Economic opportunities, opportunities for health and society. We've been seeing that, uh, for example, in the development of the COVID vaccines uh, due to artificial intelligence. It was able to, to handle a huge amount of data, which would have taken maybe 10 years. And it was able to do it in one year. AI will help to distribute vaccines better. So there are really huge opportunities. Um, but also, of course, there are threats, and uh, there are threats by how technology is used. And that are we're clearly seeing when we're looking to authoritarian states, like China, for example. So, so the question really is, what kind of framework are we setting? And we have seen that we, that we have some blank spots. We see that when we look to, to the US. Uh, we've seen that in the last two years, which uh, there's a Clearview scandal, which was a, a company that collected data from social medias, uh, mm -hmm. pictures of people, and uh, offered that to, to law enforcement. And they used that, uh, that database uh, for, for matching biometrics with uh, possible uh, crime interests. And uh, that was a loophole that was not regulated. And this is something that we should not allow, in my opinion, um, in, in a democracy. So yes, of course, we see we have loopholes. But really, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We have a lot of regulations, a lot of issues, and a lot of aspects are already covered. But of course, we need to see, do we need to update our regulatory framework for some specific aspects of the characteristic of artificial intelligence? Do and you see um, an agreement I mean, uh, at the European in Parliament, I guess this uh, debate is going on, you know, uh, as mm. you say, I mean, it's going on uh, now, mm. at this moment. Do you see that the, the debate is, is on top of, of these uh, issues? Well, actually, the and European Parliament or the European Union is uh, among the first to actually set a regulatory framework for artificial intelligence, um, because so far it was not needed in many aspects. The take the drive self-driving car. We have liability aspects. Maybe we need to up-to-date liability if, if the driverless car crashes. 
who who's going to pay for that? So that's an update. But we have all regulations for traffic already. Um, but, but now, face, I mean, the, the face the recognition also it's covered partially un under a lot of spaces. Um, but uh, it's really now the legislation of the European Parliament um, is following the so-called risk-based approach, which is taking a look at the risk and uh, the use of technology. So high risk, for example, biometric surveillance. Um, high risk where it's about uh, life and security, but also, for example, about um, job software. So it's not a, a machine in the end deciding if, if a human has access to education, for example. So these are categories that are defined as high risk, which are either forbidden or have uh, the implementation of human oversight. And I think this is a decent approach. We need to look at the risk from a technology because, I don't know, maybe 90% of technology are not a risk at all. We need to talk what is a risk to democracy, fundamental values, or, or fundamental rights. And there we need to have a, a clear framework of rules that apply and human oversight in the end. But for most of the cases, we have a perfectly existing framework. It's not a gray zone where the artificial intelligence is coming in, moving and elbowing in. Uh, that is not the case. So it's really about setting a framework for the future and not over-regulating technology per se. Do you believe, uh, Gary, that the framework in the U.S. is uh, politically is, is, is sufficient? I mean, how do you Look, see uh, it's, uh, the relationship between the big tech and the... But it's, it, yes, but it's not just big tech and the government. It's, I, I, I would look at, at this problem as a triangle. You have big Society? tech, government, and public. public. And, and, and they're all connected because public, you know, it's vote votes for, for, for elected officials, but also customers. Right. So it is, and I think that we, we, the, the relations within, within this triangle is yet to be balanced. I think it just we, we are looking for, for, for solutions. Uh, Europe definitely is just, you know, they're doing more on regulations. In America, it's all slower. Uh, but one of the problems is there's very little public demand. People mm -hmm. talk about general threats. But the moment you start talking about real things, you know, like, you know, this, the, uh, to protect their devices, they always go for complacency. Uh, uh, just, you know, they complacent because they go for, for the convenience with a new app over privacy. So, and, and that's why the politicians so far, especially in America, they see very little... Um, it's a different mindset. Exactly. Than in so Europe, this yeah. is, yes, okay, this is a problem, and it's a, but it's, there's, no, there's no pressure. Do something yeah. now. So, and I think it's very important for, uh, for, for general public to actually you know, play a big role in, in, this, in this debate. And, and again, people should take it seriously. You know, it's, it's, I've been working with Avast Software for five years, so as a security ambassador, and I attended many conferences. And I'm, sometimes I'm shocked by the, by the um, public's complacency. Uh, it's the people still, you know, using you know, primitive uh, passwords. Like the most popular one is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> And the, next, one, two, and, and, and the next one is it's from one to nine. Okay. So it's the, and, and, it is, and I'm always telling, it's, it's like, you know, digital hygiene. We know that we have to wash hands now, we brush our teeth, but we are not doing even elementary things to protect our devices. So that's why it's still, you know, just, you know, it's in, in like a very nascent uh, form of just you know, of balancing the relations in this triangle. But you, you said something about the pace of, te of, of technological breakthrough, and I think Swain made a good point. Can you name a disruptive technology that was, was introduced during her lifetime? Something that was invented in the last 30 years. Invented. Mm -hmm. Challenge you. Anything. Just name something. Invented in the last 30 years. Invented. Not in you know, improved. Invented. Yeah, yeah. You, can say, you can say iPhone, but again, but those are, those are models. All, because it's all building on what was already there. Exactly. Bingo. Like nothing so this is the, probably the last, you know, last, uh, I mean, breakthrough technology was probably Apple II in 1977. Again, huge, you know, improvement now. But the key is now, while we're not doing, you know, what I call vertical development, it's horizontal because so many people can use it. And you look at history, you know, you just you look at the last, last quarter of the 19th century. So just the, the, the computer uh, which beat up the uh, players of Go, it was already uh, on the market. Uh, yeah, but it's look, it's, it's a it was developing. It's, it's still, it's exactly. This yeah. is yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, yeah, but no, no. It's, it, of course, we're assembling. They're getting more and more. But it's it's not it's not something that that it's as you know it's not a breakthrough. It's not a penicillin. Let's say this. It's not something that you know the changes not everything. A game it's not a nylon. So this mm -hmm. it's. Uh, and you look, for instance, at the end of the 19th century, from let's say, 1875 to beginning of 20th century, and you look what's happened there, you know, from electricity, telephone, you know, the uh, uh, radio, uh, um, movies, uh, uh, submarines. So it's, and, and 
actually, in the last 25, 30 years, people are less surprised by the development. Mm -hmm. Because when I said mobile phone, the, the first mobile, mobile phone was registered in, I think, in 1962, and the first call was made in 1973. Yes, of course. But not was, used. I mean, but again, but, but they, they were holding exactly. track the, of the uh, car. But absolutely. The, existed, but, but, yeah. So, yes, mm -hmm. now this is... A, there are two things that are just, I think that makes, makes a huge difference. One is horizontal, because it's not that you know, technology that could be used by people here and there. So this is, but it's, it's massive. We're talking about billions of people having access to that. But, but the second you know, um, uh, effect is that the technology available worldwide, because all the previous technological revolutions, they affected, now we call it go, 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 golden billion, but only the, only the developed countries. Now it goes everywhere. And here we have a problem. Because technology that being invented in the free world now is being used by the regimes that are attacking us, and it's quite ironic, they use this very technology to undermine democracy mm, or this, the, our freedom. So mm. that's, that's something that that's makes the situation more complicated, probably more interesting as a challenge, because if you look at, at uh, attacks you know, coming from Russia or China, hacking attacks, or you know, this quasi quasi uh, state groups or terrorist groups, uh, so that trying to undermine our critical infrastructure, they don't invent anything. They just use our technology. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting challenge because globalization also brought us not only benefits, but new threats. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the history of humanity, the history of technology, it's all, they're always trade offs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what, what actually you know, stops us now from just. Uh, having, okay, just moving into the bright future, it's a lack of our ambitions. And Svenja just said, you know, we say, oh, problem, problem. Ten months, not even a year, in ten months, the free world had a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And to understand the differences, you know, it's just, uh, we're not here to debate, you know, the origin of the virus, but the virus came from the communist country, from dictatorship. Mm -hmm. the, the, the antidote was found in the free world. So this is, that tells you everything, you know, about, about the future, and thanks to technology. It's not just because you had a genius there, you know, just using pen, or pen and, and paper. It's because of AI, because they could process this data, and they immediately came up with a solution. So how many lives have been saved because of, because of AI? How many people now will be saved, life saved because we, we have, thanks to AI, have ability to distribute the vaccines around the world? So yeah. let's look at the positive side. And again, trade-offs. They are always losers. Yes. I don't want to sound callous. There will be jobs lost to the, to the chopping block of automation. But new uh, jobs will be created. Yeah. yeah, but new very jobs many. will be created. Every technology in the past destroyed jobs before creating new jobs. So why we should cry over spilled milk? Well, cry, I mean, it's not cry, it's just predict. Because, you know, if, we have, if we have, uh, uh, according to some, some statistics, 40%, you know, unemployment in the coming, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, uh, uh, really? And uh, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not telling. The, I'm not telling you that uh, yeah, that's going to be the case. But there, there are some, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are announcing a massive uh, unemployment in the coming uh, decades, at least. Based on what? Well, if the machine take over, no, you know, this, this more you, and more of look, of, uh, look at of activity. Yes, but this is it, oh, 200 years ago. Uh, people, 95 percent of people, if not more, were involved in agriculture. Now it's two percent. I know, but we still, we still. Oh, yes, yes. But 100 years ago, 90 percent were involved in. Okay, 95 yeah. manufacturing and agriculture. I think it's about uh, it's embracing and leading that change. I mean, we're not standing there and being absolutely. helpless and seeing no, the machines no. roll by, waving at us, hey, good luck being unemployed. But it's, uh, it's, it's a change that is coming. And it's it is about a huge us change. To, and, to and, you steer know, that change. Yeah. And, I, I and understand. To lead that. But that's true that, you know, given, you know, the, uh, the uh, impact, for instance, that globalization had on unemployment in the West, you know, I mean, you, know, you had segments of the population which are now rebelling and actually felt totally discarded and disqualified, and they're rebelling against, you know, the, uh, the current government, and they don't have any trust, and that's oh. something that we discussed, actually. That so, so it's going to be, it, it, it's, we are, uh, this is going to happen in a, in a context of, of very strong distrust. Mm -hmm. Uh, towards, uh, you know, the, 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 the political elite that you say is, is going to have to lead, yes, mm -hmm. but we have to, to be sure that I they're going to be le mm -hmm. leading. I think, of course, you need to take people's fears 
you need to treat them with respect and take them seriously. Uh, but you also need to create an opportunity and alternatives for them. Indeed. Um, and uh, this is absolutely where politics come into mind. And this is where we talk about education, reskilling, upskilling. I think we need to uh, rethink the way we think about education. Um, my father worked in, in the same company for many decades. I know people that worked their whole life in the same company. Um, I know many people my age uh, that have been by financial crisis, now the health economic crisis had very impacted career paths so far. And we're not expecting to work in the same workplace for 20 years. And um, especially coming from Germany, where we have a mindset, you do your studies, you have a degree, and that's what you work. And uh, I know that we have in other countries, uh, when I was uh, working in the UK, for example, there's a very different mindset, very much looking at the skills. And I think it's important to embrace lifelong learning, changing paths, uh, experiencing new things. Uh, I think this is an important aspect of society, and it's important to create new jobs. When we're, when we're talking about climate change, there are new jobs uh, coming up. Up in, in renewable energies. And of course, the people were afraid as well in the coal sector that they're losing their jobs and there are new jobs coming up. Of course, not everyone who's working now in one sector will we'll have the, the, the another job in the exactly. new sector. Um, but that is why it's so important that we go into the broad and steer this process as a society. But we're not helpless. We, it's us that are leading this change. Mm -hmm. It's us that are creating this, this procedure. So it's up to us to create alternatives and to offer people options in this. And uh, I think it's going to be quite a fundamental change because so far we have seen um, changes in, let's say, a bit more practical jobs. You know, cars came, I guess everyone said, okay, what about the, the horse carriages? All oh, they are going to be unemployed. They went into new professions as well. Uh, the post is not so big anymore. We have email. So there, there's always been change. And it's really about how we, we embrace this change, how we lead this change, and uh, what we are okay with as a society. And then I don't think this is a threat. This is rather a great opportunity. And uh, we need to be aware that it's not, um, let's say, automatic job. I mean, if we look at production sites, there's already much more, much less humans need on production sites than 50 years ago. But we're also having it in, in, in white collar jobs. Uh, tax accountants, which is a very repetitive task, looking at tax rules. This is something an algorithm can, can very well do as well. Um, but uh, in the end, I think you, you want a human to be responsible for, for declaring your taxes, for example. So it, it's a really a change through the whole of society. It's not what kind of job. It's really a paradigm change that we're seeing. And it's important that we as a whole, as a society, lead this. And it's nothing yes. we are standing in front of being helpless. It's mm -hmm. something we're leading. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Again, this we go back to society, to, to, to the human <laughs> side of human-machine collaboration. And uh, yes, this is many jobs could be in danger. It's the, for instance, you can look at radiology. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, uh, some of these jobs will be lost. You will need fewer people you know, to work with machines. But what is the outcome? the cost goes down. Mm -hmm. More people can afford it, not only in the developed world, but also in, 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 in developing countries. So potentially, yes, you have on one side, few thousand jobs being lost or relocated, and millions and millions of lives being saved. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's, you know, as a humanity, we, we, we win. So it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process. And, and it's speaking about these this future jobs, I mean, this Sven made an excellent point about these traditions. You know, I worked there, my father worked there, my grandfather worked there. And it's, by the way, America was always more mobile because Americans, Americans uh, uh, change jobs much more often than Europeans. But right now, when you let's look at some of the new prestigious jobs, like, you know, 3D engineer, uh, drone operator, uh, social media manager, these jobs did not exist 15 years ago. I, I used to work as a social media manager when I started my career. Exactly. My yeah. parents would have never dreamt about that when I was born. Be One day she's going to be a social media exist. manager. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I can bet that in 10, 15 years, our kids will be, will be looking for jobs that do not exist today. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, statistically. So something will be developed. Okay, the, some people will be left behind. It will be more difficult for the uh, less educated people. And, uh, Again, but that's and then, and uh, I agree with all of that. I mean, I think you, 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 all, you both have points. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to push you on, 
on uh, I find I find you have a, a little bit of an idealistic view of we're going to steer that uh, yeah. it's it's going to be okay. I I think that there are so many questions which are being raised. I mean, and things are happening without without people really participating. Yeah. Look at airports. At the moment, uh, at airports now, yes. uh, airports are becoming absolutely empty. Now everything is getting automa uh, automatic. You know, in airports, you you have to push, uh, you have to do the whole process. You put your, yes. it's getting tagged, it's yes. getting uh, taken, etc. The result is that airports are empty. Is it is it something that we want? I'm I'm just r r raising no. the question. Or do we want people? Do we want human faces? Do we want interaction? I think we also have to take that into account, and not just the sheer you know question of efficiency and cost. Actually, look, it's the. Uh, it's a balance. It's a balance. But yeah. you know, if you lost your suitcase, so you rather rely on computer than a human finding it. So and uh, and we have tens of millions of pieces of luggage being lost every year. So and uh, if you are on this side of equation, you know, you would like machine to help you to find it. <laughs> so it's the it's all it's at the end of the day it's balance. Yes, <laughs> I would like to see some faces. I'm uh, perfect. You know, just I'm very very happy. You know, just to talk to someone. Uh, all of us, you know, had the same experience. You call somewhere and this is, you have one machine, you know, just a recorded vo voice and then another one and this. It's, it's a, bit, a bit, you know, a we bit annoying. We still want a, a world of humans. But, 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 but <laughs> still, but now, by the way, the AI now is, by the way, they, 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 they are getting better in, in, in imi the imi imitating yes. the conversation. But again, it's, this is, it's service. Mm. And in service, I want, you know, this, this, it's, it's um, efficiency. I want it to be effective and just to serve me. So... What we do with, with so many people that are just, you know, that are just, uh, are no longer needed there? That's a question to answer. But it's, we, we, but, but you have to recognize this question does exist. It's legitimate. Yes. And instead of trying to terrorize public mind by pointing at Hollywood uh, movies mm -hmm. or, you know, hearing to Elon Musk, you know, telling about us about the rest of the world or Yuval Hariri or it's an army of doomsayers. So we should say we do have a problem. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, it's, it's a balance. And let's, you know, let's, Try to find a solution. By the way, let me let me let me point. Uh, sorry, uh, Gary, to uh, the, the, because the time is running, and I really want us to address uh, to really? the two last questions. With uh, no people are going to ask you questions, but ah. there is one question I wanted really to address: is what you said about you know the fact that yes, uh, we did create you know all these uh, fantastic technologies which give us uh, indeed so much power, so much possibilities you know uh, for the future but they are they, they are now being you know uh, uh, you know propagated uh, worldwide and they are being taken uh, taken on by uh, you know authoritarian regimes and and w w which which do, do not have the kind of uh, probably debates and uh, worries that we ha uh, that we've been raising now uh, concerning you know rights or risk uh, privacy etc so my question is I, I mean, I, I wanted actually to, to, to uh, quote this uh, uh, young uh, journalist, Kai Stripmatter, who spent 10 years in, uh, in China and just wrote, uh, wrote a book which was published in France, which is called uh, uh, Dictatorship 2.0, uh, where he actually shows, you know, the sort of uh, a union and marriage of, of this totalitarian regime and technology and how they're using now, you know, artificial, artificial intelligence and technology in the wider sense to sort of create a, a, a state with thousands of eyes. And, and he tells the story of uh, going into a startup, a Chinese startup in, uh, in uh, Beijing, and uh, coming in, and of course, immediately his uh, picture is coming on the big screen, and you know, they have this name, he, they have his age, but they get it wrong, by the way, and uh, they have uh, uh, his mood. Uh, you know, because they have sort of a facial recognition and, uh, and artificial intelligence, you know, uh, uh, software which is able to uh, actually determine, you know, what he's thinking, the mood he's in, etc. And the, he explained very bluntly that they've been actually building up, uh, it's an enthusiastic project, building up throughout China, uh, uh, the concept of, of these thousands of eyes, which are helping, for instance, the police to identify any kind of strange situation because everything is being watched you know through cameras and immediately all people are through their iPhones their uh, different you know uh, uh, you know machines are being uh, watched 
any time, any second during the day. And they're using that to build up this absolutely f gigantic database. And, uh, and also another uh, point that he makes is that they have started doing this social scoring of, uh, you know, since they can actually see what people are doing during the day, they see how they walk their dogs, if they are do, do it neatly or uh, pick up, you know, uh, the trash or not, etc. And the people get, uh, in, in several cities that they're experiencing this, this uh, situation, they, they get grades, score. You know, and and so so my, my question is, of course, you you're gonna say we we're not there, we'll never be there. But my question is, is the 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 fact that authoritarian regimes uh, are using these uh, technologies in this uh, fashion somehow will get to blur because because of te of technology uh, of innovation the the, uh, the sort of border between. Uh, the way our, our you know, free societies are functioning and these regimes. I mean, d does it bring an element which will lead to blur because we, you will have to say, okay, for security, we'll do the same for the police or we'll do... How do you see this, this particular uh, uh, element? It's very passionate. Uh, I'm just surprised that you are surprised. So dictators. I'm not surprised. No, I'm describing the thing. Yeah, but uh, with such a passion. So <laughs> it was as if you are surprised that dictators always use technology to subdue uh, their people and just to 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 strengthen uh, 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 their their power. So just to to uh, control people. So you didn't mention the Uyghur genocide that has been also conducted using. Which is actually uh, exactly. being watched extremely. Exactly. I mean, exactly. So extremely so closely. of course they will build it. Of course, as is every every new technological uh, um, tool will be used to 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 um, uh, solidify their control of of um, uh, people's lives, mm -hmm. uh, but now you move to the free world, and yes. of course, as Svenja said, it is it's up to us to make the difference. But there's something else that 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 you missed. It's not a one-way street. Yes, the state is going all powerful thanks to technology, mm -hmm. but an individual can fight back. A group of hackers can paralyze the entire state. So, and now we, we, are, we are asking, this is an existential question. If we consider the threat from China, communist China, from Putin's dictatorship, from Iranian mullahs, from all these facts and terrorists uh, around the world, serious, are we going to fight back? Do we have political will? Because West today the West, the free world. West includes also Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, I would even s include, you know, uh, it's India, South Africa, Brazil. So um, it's technologically, it, the, the, the balance was never so much in favor of the free world. Never. So this is, and all we're missing is political will. Because the moment we show political will, they'll recognize. Yes, Putin's hackers can, you know, attack American critical infrastructure, the meat industry or pipeline. America can shut down the whole Russia and by the whole, the whole China. We don't have to do it, but we should demonstrate that it's policy of deterrence. That, you know, it's, it's like a, nu it's a nuclear age. So this is, it's the, we need to show that we are willing to defend our freedom. And if we show this will, things might change because it will also encourage dissidents in these countries. There are many talented Chinese that would like to bring down this horrible dictatorship. Let the, give them hope. So, and of course, we should not, under no circumstances, to follow the same ten, uh, tempting example to collect data and, 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 and to, for, um, for the reasons of, you know, of, um, um, oh, security and, and you, can, you, have, you can have come up with many good explanations why you need to, to um, uh, uh, interfere uh, uh, with, 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 um, uh, with privacy. And, and what is also important, these big tech corporations, exactly. they I should stop applying it. double standards mm -hmm. to America, Germany, France, and other free countries, and to countries like Russia or, uh, um, or China, where many of them are bending the rules to protect mm -hmm. their business. Mm -hmm. Again, they operate here, they, most of the money they make on, on, on the soil of the free world, and here is the public must demand that they will treat people who are not so lucky to be born in the free world. Uh, uh, treat, treat them with equal respect, protecting their privacy, and basically telling all these regimes that if they're not happy, they can go to hell. 
because at the end of the day, you know, they, they, they don't have, you know, the equivalents of, of, of Western tech. They still rely on it. And the moment we'll, we'll recognize the threat, I think the, the, the balance may start changing. Thank you. I, I think it's a very important point. And uh, actually, you know, uh, in the discussions we had with uh, uh, this, uh, again, this billionaire the tech, I was very struck by the fact that for him, it was not so shocking, this sort of a piling up of data by China. And he was actually pretty admiring of the Chinese model uh, instead of being ready to fight it. So well, if you look at it from a solely technological approach, it's pretty impressive what they're creating. It but uh, coming fr from a democratic approach, this is absolutely horrible what they're creating. And um, and again, we I mean, we have no influence on what China is doing. But of course, we can say, are we distributing them with technology? Are we exporting technology that they can use for oppression of minorities, that they can use for their social scoring system? And uh, it's it's a lot of levels that play in a lot of technology use we see uh, by this authoritarian regime that we have in China. And uh, the, the, the question you were mentioning about the transatlantic, you know, need for exactly. transatlantic cooperation, exactly, and this is and the this creation is the point. Of, of norms. But exactly, do you believe that it's realistic, or uh, is the the uh, let's say the uh, sort of growing role a part and and a place of uh, China in this uh, game? Uh, sort of, in a way, threatens this uh, this capacity of the West to create norms in this in, the, in this particular well, field. Well, what we see from China is uh, that they're pretty dominant and that they're not caring so much about alliances. And uh, this is really where democracies need to get together. And that's why I'm extremely happy we're having this week the EU-US summit, and it's planning to launch the Trade and Tech Council, where it's exactly about this, about mm -hmm. setting norms and standards, about a framework that we are, as democracies, being willing to embrace technology, to use technology, because this is what we need. We need star standards and norms, and this is, of course, from the European parliamentarian. This is our, our, our everyday <laughs> work, talking <laughs> about norms and standards. And it always sounds, uh, I'm sorry, but very unsexy, but it's actually the, the foundation of how our societies works. We have norms and standards in which we operate, and this is enshrined into law. And it's important. But it's been difficult with the U.S. on the on It has on been difficult, and we, we just had, had with Gary, we have a different mindset in, in the U.S. <laughs> and in the EU. EU is coming more from a privacy standard point. Exactly. In the U.S. it's more about maybe innovation. economic uh, potential and innovation. And I think it's important to, to bring this to mind because European tends to be overprotective right. and sometimes even protectionist. Uh, well, the U.S. may be a bit too careless in its approach. And it's important to bring this together. And if we manage, and we really need to manage this, then we need to get other democracies on board to really have a clear front. And I've already heard pe some people saying we're, we might be coming up into a technology Cold War situation um, mm -hmm. where we have different approaches to that. Right. Uh, as a studied historian, I'm a bit, uh, personally, a bit c careful with using this f this phrase of Cold War situation. Uh, but we're clearly coming into a direction where we're having alternatives about how to use technology. Will it be in a democratic way or will it be in an authoritarian way? And we really need to work th for this. We really need to work for this democratic approach. And we absolutely can work for that. We're strong uh, democracies. We're strong economies. And we can really move this forward huge, huge, huge innovations and developments was developed in the Western world. Gary just said it. And it's really about us, how we're going to shape this future. Do you see this uh, um, potential for actually uh, limit, li limit the, um, uh, the disagreements and come to some kind of uh, common uh, approach? Because yes, I think many, many, many with, many with all the differences, you know, some, some of this difference embedded in economic models and, yes. and, and, and also with political and societal customs. Uh, uh, Europe uh, and America, I don't know now, probably you should add United Kingdom because it's in between, so <laughs> this is, yeah. Uh, so Europe uh, from uh, uh, B Baltics to, to uh, United States, so have mm, too much in common. So this, the, the, the idea of, uh, of, of uh, working um, if not in concert, but looking for compromises. So With I think more in common that what divides us. Exactly. Yeah. So this is this this much more in common. So um, I think it's it's it, 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 I'm quite comfortable that the the uh, concepts and solutions that Sven mentioned they they will be found. 
What worries me is that you still need political will to implement it, dealing with the other side. Mm -hmm. The other side doesn't go away. Whether you like it or not, it's not a cold war, it's a hybrid war. But this is not a war we can stop because it's imposed on us by them. Because they cannot escape this war, they have to demonstrate that we are the enemies. This is the way that every authoritarian or totalitarian regime worked in history, and, and uh, China and Russia are no, are no different, so they, or Iranian mullahs. So they look at us as enemies, and they try to use their propaganda machine to actually to, to, uh, to, uh, to um, raise this, this emotional outrage of the people they control. And of course they try to, to hurt us. And uh, we have to, as I already said, we have to demonstrate political will uh, um, uh, and, uh, and of us fighting back. Um, we, we do have technological ability, and this should be part of the plan. Part of the plan because it's uh, every, every, every country, every group uh, trying to abuse this technology and to harm the free world should know that there's a price tag. You do it, you pay a price that you know, will make it um, uh, considerably less attractive. Um, well, that brings us back to digital literacy as well when we're talking about propaganda, yep. but also cybersecurity is the topic yep. we haven't touched upon yet today. Yep. Uh, but those are two very, very important aspects when we're talking about technological advance and democracy versus uh, authoritarianism. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to shift to questions. I just wanted to say that uh, there are two things that I'm sort of uh, uh, want to point, you know, after this conversation. The first one is that uh, clearly, uh, from your, both your points of view, the machines are not uh, uh, superseding and overtaking <laughs> the human mind, but uh, the, human, uh, the, the humans have to work hard to uh, make sure that, that uh, you know, this, this sort of uh, technological progress is not going to uh, become a threat to us. And uh, I think that, uh, in a way, it, it, it leads to uh, quoting uh, Tocqueville in the sense that both of you talk about the importance of uh, civil society and, 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 and political uh, and politics to get into this, this, this question very seriously. And I think Tocqueville was saying that uh, in fact, uh, despotism is only, uh, in fact, uh, the result of democracy taking leave from itself. So uh, the, the idea would be actually that we're not going to do that and uh, to, to fight for this, for this future uh, of us, you know, uh, with in uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and technological progress. Uh, we're going to go to the questions now, and I guess uh, Jeannette is going to... Uh, raise for us. I mean, he, she has been gathering the questions coming mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the audience, and she will uh, now, uh, you know, uh, tell us the first question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Law. And uh, I think this is also the moment where we can still encourage uh, our participants to to ask questions. We already got two um, concrete from from the from public. One to uh, Gary Kasparov, referring to one movie, to Blade Runner, uh, 40, 40 years ago. Uh, what what lessons would you draw from this movie? Um, and I don't know if you were referring to to this movie before. Mm -hmm. um, and another one would be on the algorithms, actually, and whether we or how do we guarantee the neutrality um, of, algorithm, of algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, this is maybe a question for both of you. Um, and then we have two other questions on, um, you were mentioning, Gary, um, the uh, lack of political will, uh, which is a crucial factor, but are politicians actually... Um, informed enough? Well, is, is the level of information uh, sufficient uh, that we need um, for the right understanding to develop uh, on the longer run um, uh, an AI that serves uh, our goals? And do politicians actually uh, yeah, know how to regulate because they have enough information? So I would also be interested in to see uh, yeah, the different perspectives on it, maybe from a European standpoint and an uh, American one. Um, maybe we can start from that. Maybe we can start mm -hmm. from that, yeah, definitely. Gary, do Let's you want start to start, with Svenja? Well, um, th that's of course, that that's of course is an interesting question. Um, and I think uh, as in general politicians, as in general of society, sometimes lack knowledge about what artificial intelligence is. 
and uh, I've seen that in the last year in the Parliament when we started working on, on this topic, um, that there is uh, in, in broad aspects of society a bit of misunderstanding, and many people tend to think, oh, this is something very new, very disruptive, when in fact it's here. So I think in general we need to do a lot of education and understanding about technology. And um, for politicians, the task is, in general, we tend to regulate something that's already there. Uh, for especially artificial intelligence, we're trying to regulate something we cannot yet imagine the potential it will have. We, we're talking about technology that can adapt and then create absolute new opportunities. We had the example of the, of the vaccines, uh, Gary had the example um, of uh, radiology, uh, where, where X-rays are better analyzed by AIs. Um, but we do not know what in the future might be coming up. And uh, politics tend to regulate and over-regulate what is already there. So we're now having the task to regulate something for the future. And that's why it's so important that we're not over-regulating, that we're setting a framework uh, which is pretty general, which is taking democratic, which is taking liberal principles into account and setting a framework in which we're going to operate and not trying to restrict every kind of single case or every kind of technology. And this is the challenge, the sh challenge for policymakers. And that also goes together with the other question about neutrality of algorithms. Algorithms are always neutral. It really it's just a technology. It really depends on the data they are fed with. And this is where risk lies, because if we are repeating biases that are existing in society, because the quality of data is, uh, is not good enough, because the quality of data is biased. Um, for example, a, a job software that has never seen a female CEO will, from all applications, not suggest you a woman that is female CEO, because the, the data that the algorithm has fed have never seen that. So it's really uh, the, the technology is, is not the, the challenge. The, the challenge is having good data sets and not repeating human biases and mm -hmm. human mistakes. Maybe just a small specific, uh, specification, a follow-up question on the last uh, aspect, because there's one question about the algorithms and whether they can undermine democracy. And you said, well, it's up to us and they are neutral as such. But what about the psychological influence of social media by, um, algorithms, so the, the social media um, kicking in and the if, the if there's a real danger of AI for, for democracy in this respect? I'm not sure if I fully understand that question, to be honest, um, because what is the psychological influence of social media and what does that have to do with algorithms? Uh, we're seeing content on social media based on algorithms, based on our usage behavior. Um, I, for example, uh, I just recently became a godmother and uh, I searched for a lot of baby products and suddenly all I'm seeing is baby products. Um, that did not yet make me to want to have children on my own. So uh, how far is it influencing my, my re really specific behavior? Or is this only trying to influence my buying behavior? Um, so I, d I don't see a threat uh, to, to democracy on, on social media, but of course the psychological impact on social media, and this is something a bit else in my opinion than, than what we're talking about today, um, is of course we're, we're seeing studies that a lot of people are being unhappy in that self when they're exposed to a lot of you know happy things on social media and they're they're com comparing their life and saying oh I'm not traveling so much oh I'm I'm not having such a beautiful house or, or what what not uh, so yes of course there there can be a psychological impact um, but that is again about how we use technology and how we embrace technology yeah just to add you know it's um, a follow up what Sven you said you know when we talk about the data it's uh, complaining about it. it's complaining about the mirror so this ai is just this mirrors you know mm -hmm. the bias in our society when you look at the mirror and you don't like what you see there two ways you can distort the mirror that's what's being suggested or you can try to work on you so just to make you look more presentable <laughs> so i think it's very important to understand again the answer for the question of this debate is negative because it's not about technology it's about humans same you know with with social media it's about humans who are regulating it. So it's this, it's humans are setting up the algorithms. So yes, they say algorithms are neutral. No, because you know, very often you know, they apply different standards because they have you know, their political preferences. Again, the moment we establish universal standards for you know, banning people, for instance, if we ban you know, people on one side of the equation for fighting vaccines, we should do the same with opposite, opposite side. So it's very important that you know, we humans you know, work out on the standards. 
because you know that's that's what machine will 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 do will follow the, 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 these guidelines. But if I may, uh, it seems to me that the standards are being for now set by the big companies which are doing making money with these algorithms, and that's the the uh, only logic that that is there. So they are actually studying. All, the, all of our uh, moves, you know, on the social media and on the internet, and then using using them to suggest, you know, in the direction they think uh, we like. Look, that, I, that's uh, what is uh, yes, but that's, uh, that's yes. It's not just about money. So it's just it's this. It's, so this it's not is only us. It's mm. also the use of you our. You can opt out with privacy and under GDPR mm. of this as well. But this is something that we're regulating it's as well, and and the on the European level with the Digital Market Act, where it's really about what uh, what uh, competences and and what. <laughs> limits do especially social media companies have but also this big gatekeeper um, companies so of course there, there are some loopholes that we need to to close uh, but especially in Europe we already have a strong existing privacy regulation uh, but it's the, you just you talked about big companies but they set up the rules you know based on numbers oh. and yeah. authoritarian regimes use troll factories to to uh, uh, um, abuse it because all of a sudden, you know, uh, an account of an activist has thousands of complaints mm -hmm. and automatically being blocked. They know just it's mm -hmm. most of them bot generated. Look, even I was at one point, you know, as the, uh, my, my Russian account on Facebook was blocked. Of course, you know, my Twitter friends, you know, create a big, big fuss. And then it just, you know, they, they, they brought me back. But it happened with definitely in Russia mm -hmm. with many Ukrainians patriots, you know, they have been banned but because Russians complain about it, so, uh, because they use the hated language, they they blasted Putin for aggression against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So China, is this, it's, it, they all know Saudis. Mm -hmm. So we just, you know, mm -hmm. Human Rights Foundation, we're in the chairman, we had a movie about Khashoggi's murder, the dissident. And the Saudis just, you know, you can, Saudis trolls are just trying to bring the ratings down and attacking all people who are promoting the movie. Mm -hmm. So it's taking the, again, of course. Ab we're absolute taking advantage. But uh, yeah. and, it's all about humans. It's not about just don't blame machines. You know, no, we have a human, human use machines. They use bots. They they know how how to push the right buttons. But at the end of the day, it's about it's about humans with malign intentions mm -hmm. that are that abusing these uh, um, new uh, opportunities presented by AI. I think human-centric approach, this is what it's all coming down to. Machines or technologies, they're to assist to serve humans and not to replace humans. And uh, this is what we always need to keep in mind while developing and also while regulating. Uh, Human-centric approach. Uh, I think this could be, I mean, we still have some, some time, so yeah, do you I have will, more I would just add, because this is that's we're just to, to, uh, to follow up what just Fender said, it's now, it's the borrowed piece of wisdom. So we talked about, you know, this is the quill, and we're talking about founding fathers. This, it's um, um, uh, the one of the pioneers of, of, of um, AI was uh, uh, Joseph Weizenbaum, uh, creator of ELISA, actually. It's the, it's the first, you know, Alexa type or Siri type, mm -hmm. you know, just it's in mi it's mid-60s. Mid and in 1976, he wrote the book, uh, Computer Power and Human Reason, From Judgment to Calculation. And in this book, he talked about semantic difference, but actually it's not just semantic, between choosing and deciding. Machines decide. Because if you go down, 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 down this, this, is this decision tree, I did it because I was told so. Hmm. Humans choose. Because if you go down, 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 the answer is I did it because I want it. Hmm. So it's, we always choose. Mm -hmm. And it is, yes, the killer robot on the field can decide to, uh, to um, execute his power and to exterminate someone on, 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 on in the field. But, be, but because mm -hmm. the programmer chose to, put to, on the field. to, to <laughs> chose actually to, to incorporate something that made machine to de decide. Again, it looks like, you know, just it's semantic. I'm not sure how it sounds in French. Well, you it's know, all so coming yes. down yes. to human decisions at the end or uh, in the beginning. Exactly. This, it's, the, the, there's a human component in, in all of that. Yes, the human component is shrinking. Extreme. But but still, even if it becomes really small, even if we do belong to last few decimal places, it still has decisive factor, mm -hmm. and that's why again, it says this, there's no there's no need to 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 panic, and I I again whatever whatever Elon Musk or whoever said, I saw no evidence, and I spoke to quite a few you know experts in the field, uh, just about just that, that machines could overtake humanity. 
It's, I, by the way, watching the Terminator, I never understood why Skynet wanted to kill all the people. So this was, <laughs> what's the, what was the point? Yeah, it's the, and, um, but the problem is, you know, fear sells. Just this is again. That's the way public mind works. Mm. Oh, fear, and, and again, th there are reasons. But to fear be sometimes mm. is, is is necessary but to, have, to see the danger. But, that's, but the mean, fight, we have to fight uh, it. I, 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 I'm with, sorry, with, 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 with ambition. Of with ambition we things. do, we do. But uh, I think that uh, you know the the unease and and the fear is not just stupid fear. I think oh, uh, I, you know just it's not just you know, sort of. A, uh, instinctive and uh, uh, irrational. I think there is also a fear which is can be rational and needed, because it, it helps you evaluate the risk. And I think that when you say uh, that the the, the uh, contribution of uh, human mind is shrinking, I think that there is an ease about actually uh, what it means in terms of of you know uh, maybe the lapse of time when you have yeah, to make yeah. when you still have decision to make yeah. or if you abandon too much of the process yeah. mm. to the machines you are actually in a way not losing control to the machines but losing control of the process. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. think it's important to understand um, absolute. I mean there are threats, but there are much more opportunities. There are much more greater potential. But it's important to understand when people are afraid and, and if there are risks to address those and to often bust some myths about that and bust some misconception. And I think this is important. So we have, have, we have absolute credible risks that we need to address, that we need to put into, into a framework to, to regulate that, to keep that risk under control. Um, we have threats, we, we talked about threats, but we have also a huge, huge potential for our society, for our economies, um, for, for our health. We had several, uh, several uh, examples. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, about, yes, addressing risks, busting myths and misconception, but also about telling the po positive stories and helping people embark on these positive stories and on these positive examples and really embracing this change and the huge, huge potential it has for our societies. Uh, uh, just again, we're wrapping up our conversation now. Well, we <laughs> still have a few. Uh, yeah. Actually, we still have no, time. Since, for since, we since, since we mentioned, you know, but risk. We could wrap risk. It no, no, no. Earlier. Since we um, yeah. we mentioned risk, as I say, I, no one can blame me for avoiding risk. So I always had a very risky life, and I can tell you something from my personal experience. If somebody tells you that he or she is fearless, don't believe them. Is that it's we all have fears, and mm -hmm. the difference is how we can handle it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. So should we be fearful about this AI danger? Yes. Mm -hmm. But that's again, it's, it's this, this fear should make us work you know, towards solutions. Mm -hmm. And the, the best way you know, to fight your fear is to become ambitious. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you're ambitious, you know, you look, you know, up to the skies or deep down in the waters. There's so much for us to explore. So I'm going to ask you, uh, we, we are getting to solutions actually now. So, I mean, we've been talking about them, in fact, but let's, let's do it in a more journalistic way, if you, if you will. And of, of, uh, let's imagine that now you're in charge. You're in charge, you know, in, uh, in the U.S., for instance. Wow. <laughs> I was not born well, in America. I, mean, I, I know, I know. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a science fiction, uh, <laughs> you know, scenario. And uh, so in, in that particular field, what is, the, what is it that you're, you're doing to actually address this issue? Look, I still believe it's, 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 it's psychological. It's about recovering the spirit of exploration, innovation, you remember, you know, JFK, mm -hmm. ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I'm afraid today any American politician who says it could be, you know, just, you know, fired instantly because people don't want to hear that. <laughs> so that's they, good, that's Gary, that you can say it. No, now. but that's, that's, that's we, we want to go back to, 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 to the times where, you know, that's the, the people were dreaming about space, about big, you know, big things. Hopefully now it's happening. By the way, we, it's, it's, it's quite ironic. Maybe that's, that's, that's the way the history works. We had one of the worst years in, in, I don't know, in just since World War II, the year of pandemic, and it was just it was tragic for many of us. I lost my mother to COVID, and so I know what tragedy is. But, but, uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, we saw this as a new success in space. They are still so dreaming. Is, Elon yeah. Musk is, is afraid, but he's, Good, he's dreaming. Uh, and he's going Let forward. Let him dream, you know. Just and he's know, going forward. I, I want him to dream more and, and, and talk less. Right. So that's the, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the... Uh, and, but we want young generation, we want people to have this chance, you know, so, and we need to just open the floodgates. 
I am a believer. So this is, I did uh, six years ago, I did a commencement speech in St. Louis University in Missouri. And, and I told them, you know, just about renewing the spirit of uh, exploration and just, you know, looking for, so for, uh, for new lands, for new horizons. And I said, look, today, it's, uh, 2015, flying to Mars is less riskier than for Columbus to cross the Atlantic because at least you know the distance and you have the map. So this is, <laughs> look, you know, it's, it's, we, have, we, we have a tremendous power in our hands. You know, the one device that we use every day, it's, it's 1,000 times more powerful than the crazy supercomputer in, 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 in 1976, 77. Mm -hmm. How do we use it? I'm not sure we use it very effectively. So, it, and it's, instead of, you know, instead of uh, complaining and about whining that this is a problem, we should concentrate on new opportunities. These machines are not going, intelligent machines will make us redundant. They're promoting us. And it's all about attitude. If I was in the position to address the audience, to address the public, mm -hmm. that would be my message. It's the, the answer is there. You know, it's not, I cannot, you know, I cannot make a new law that will make everybody happy. But we can start working together. And, and what I will do, I will just definitely remove some regulations that are standing on the way of, this, of the energy. So obviously, you know, we have to protect individuals. But we have to give people a chance to actually to create things. There's, there's so much can be created. And the whole story with vaccine is a proof. In 10 months, we, answer, we found a response. And you remember what was, what was in the beginning? Oh, it will take two, three years. It will not happen. The whole planet will be paralyzed. We're back to normal. Almost. Uh, no, but in, um, um, I think the key is really trust, and uh, trust doesn't mean doesn't equal understanding. I have no clue how the technology in my phone works that it works. I have no clue. I, I know how to operate that, <laughs> but I'm not bothered that I don't know how to use it. What for me is important is trust that I can rely on privacy, for example, that I know there are technologies that guard my privacy, that I am not having the government spy on me, for example. Um, which in Germany now is a new thing, but okay. Um, so uh, this is important. I think trust is the key. We're not understanding all technology around us, ha never have and never will. Um, so I think we need, and this of course coming as a European politician, a framework in which we know, uh, which we as humans, in which we as citizens, as consumers, know we can trust and rely on technology. And that comes if we have a clear framework in which we say, this is the kind of range of technologies uh, or, or use cases of technologies that we are applying, um, that we're knowing it was safely developed, that we're knowing uh, it was taking needed measures to prevent repetition of biases, for example, or, or discrimination. I think this is key, trusting and knowing that this is happening. And it doesn't matter that you're not understanding the technology. And you do for that, you do not need a warning sign every time uh, an AI application is used. Watch out, this is uh, enabled by right. AI. So it's really about mm -hmm. trust and that you know you have the same framework in which you operate. Because this is how we as society work. I don't need yes. a sign on, on every fruit that I'm eating saying <laughs> this was produced without or with. <laughs> because we, I know I can rely on a safe framework that I'm having safe food. And this goes as well for AI, this goes for technology. That's right. Uh, I mean, uh, that's a very good point. I think in, in that uh, respect, uh, uh, what I was saying before about the fact that you know the crisis of trust which exists you know uh, today in the West uh, you know towards uh, institutions and uh, and a sort of self doubt also that we I mean that uh, Gary is trying to fight when he's saying let's go forward etc mm -hmm. is there and it's part of the this whole situation uh, I, I think we, we should still have a little bit of time for one more maybe uh, question and then we'll try to wrap up this conversation. So just following up on what you, what you just said, Svenja, with uh, the trust issue, there's one question of Johannes um, uh, talking about the liability issues. So when something goes wrong, and maybe you could also refer to the current discussions um, that have been going on uh, at the European level here, um, yeah, who, who's taken responsible for that? And um, on, on what data are we basing uh, our decisions on then? Mm. Well, that is a pretty technical question. I mean, we had the example of the self-driving car, and that's a very popular example, and we're often debating, oh, who, uh, 
who will the self-driving car drive over? The young kid or the, the elderly lady? Uh, so we're always debating from a moral standpoint. This is all solved by technology. But the question is, who actually pays for if a self-driving car has an accident? Who is liable? And that is something that we're actually debating as well uh, in, in the parliament and this, this framework. And this is a good example where we have existing legislation where we just need to update it to the characteristics of AI. So uh, because it might be hard to prove where a mistake was. Was it the data bad? Was it the development was bad? Was it a mistake by the developer? Was it a mistake by the deployer? Uh, so who in the end will be reliable? This will be a question to answer. I, I'm not having an answer yet to that, but this is a good example where we need to update existing legislation we have from a very, very practical point of view. Uh, just following your, uh, your example of the driver's car and, and, a, and a hard choice, it, it had to make, it would have to make by facing this inevitable human casualty. The answer is very simple. It will, it will hit the person that, you know, that is being designated by a human programmer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it will simply follow the, 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 the rules that are being imposed on it. And by the way, you cannot blame machine for that because you already put it in an in, in impossible situation. So it's not that you, know, you had a good choice, but the choice will be done by human before it happens. Again, it brings us to choices made by humans. Mm -hmm. And machine will decide based on this choice. Yeah. OK, well, uh, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is time now to wrap up this uh, conversation. It has been, I think, uh, quite fascinating and uh, passionate. And uh, I think with the, this idea, which has been repeated on and on, that the human factor uh, remains the, uh, the factor. <laughs> in our world and uh, so I thank you uh, I want to thank you actually uh, very warmly both our speakers uh, Svenja Han thank you very much for coming all the way from Brussels to uh, talk to us and share your views on this very important topic and thank Gary so Kasparov uh, thank you very much for making it from uh, all the way from New York <laughs> and uh, I hope we hope to see you both in Tocqueville uh, and maybe uh, in the fall or at least uh, during further conversations on, on democracy and the future. Thank you. Thank you so much.